so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me. I'd like to thank them also in, for inviting Ravi, so I'm not the oldest speaker at the conference. Um, I, looked at, I looked at the abstracts, and I, I think my talk may be the most elementary talk out of everyone's talk here, so that's probably, hopefully, not so bad. So what is the smallest integer? Well, zero is the answer. My real question is, what is the smallest non-zero integer? And I'm going to make that a little bit harder by talking about algebraic integers. Okay, so the first thing is, what is an algebraic integer? So it's a generalization of an integer, and it's also a generalization of an algebraic number. So here's a definition. It's of a root of an irreducible polynomial with coefficients in Z and leading coefficient 1. So as an example, square root of 5 minus 1 on 2 is an algebraic integer because it's the root of this polynomial. On the other hand, the square root of 7 minus 1 on 2 is not an algebraic integer, even though it looks quite similar. Well, it's a root of this polynomial. You might complain. The definition says just has to exist a root of some irreducible polynomial. But basically, there's a unique irreducible polynomial of a Q, for which the number is a root of. And it's this up to scalar. And so this is the only one. And therefore, it's not an algebraic integer. OK, so these are the players. So just that this definition makes sense, it's not so hard to check that a rational number is algebraic if and only if it's an integer. So that's a good uh, condition for a generalization of an integer. All right, so here's some other properties of algebraic integers. If you take the sum of two algebraic integers, you get an algebraic integer. If you take their product, you also get an algebraic integer. So we saw an example on the last page. So this was an algebraic integer. You take its 30th power, it should still be an algebraic integer. And there it is. That's looking a bit more like an integer than maybe it started. Whereas with this example here, if you take its 30th power and compute it, well, it somehow has different behavior. So even though they look quite similar, you can even just see from this calculation that the first one looks a little bit more like an integer than the second. All right. So here's our problem. What's the smallest non-zero algebraic integer? So to work out what this means, well, let's just think of what we have so far. So this is an algebraic integer. It's about 0.6. Its 30th power is also an algebraic integer. And that's given by that fairly small number. So this isn't going to work. Clearly, we can get as small as, as we like to 0. So there isn't any smallest algebraic integer in this naive sense. So we need to think a little bit more. So algebraic integers come not just alone, but they come in bunches. I mean, by definition, they're the root of a unique irreducible polynomial, and that polynomial has other roots. And so the conjugates of an algebraic integer, even just the conjugate of an algebraic number, are just the other roots of the same polynomial. These companion roots are called conjugates. <coughs> so for example, the conjugate of this, well, it's a quadratic irrational. It's an uh, irreducible polynomial has degree 2. One of the roots is this. The other root, if you remember what the quadratic formula is, that you change the sign on the square root. So the other root is this number. And this no longer looks so small. So on the one hand, the first number is small, but its conjugate is very big. So given an algebraic number of degree d, well, we have a collection of d conjugates, one of whom is alpha. Let's call them alpha 1 up to alpha d. And what we want is some measure of how big an algebraic integer that reflects not just the number itself, but also reflects the property of its conjugates. So what's a good way of measuring the size? So there's no unique good way of measuring the size. So we can try various measures of size and see how they work. So for example, one way of measuring the size, you could consider the smallest absolute value of all the conjugates. That's probably not going to work, just in the example we saw on the last page, square root of 5 minus 1 on 2, its powers one conjugate is very small, one conjugate is very big. So this minimum isn't going to be so good. Well, it could also consider the opposite. You can consider its maximum. That's another good measure. And you consider basically anything in between. So what's something in between? An average. Well, there's more than one average. You can take its, its geometric mean, its arithmetic mean. There are many different things you could try, but it's probably not so good just to kind of predetermine in advance what we want, we want to kind of do a few examples and try and work out what's going to be the question that reflects uh, the, best, the best answer. As Ravi said, we start with the answer and then we work out maybe what the question is. Okay. 
So we need to say a little bit more about a number and its conjugates. So an algebraic number, well, its conjugates are just the other root of its minimal polynomial. So let's call the minimal polynomial px. If you have a polynomial px, you can factor it into its roots, which are alpha i, and it has an expression like this. So if we use the fact that alpha is an algebraic integer, what that means is when we expand this, we get a polynomial with leading term 1, and all the other terms are integers. So that's what we, we're using the fact that it's an integer, is that the leading coefficient will be 1. Well, of course, it's always be 1 in this form, but it, we get everything has integer coefficients. So we can expand it out, and if you've expanded out a polynomial, you know some bit what the terms look like. The, the leading term is just minus the sum of the roots, and then you get various combinations of the roots there, thereafter, until finally the last term is the product of all the roots. So again, if we have an algebraic integer, this polynomial has integer coefficients. So we know that all of these expressions in the roots have, uh, well, they are integers. So we know, for example, the sum of the conjugates is an integer, and the product of the conjugates is an integer. So we can already use that to say something about the size of algebraic integers. Because if we look at the constant term, the product is an integer. And, well, the product is not zero because we're going to rule out zero. I think we can accept that zero is probably the smallest integer. So therefore, if we take the product of all the roots and take their absolute value, it's an integer, and we are going to use the fact that the smallest integer, that's, an, that's a rational number, is one. And so what we see is that the product of all the conjugates is at least one. So in particular, the maximum is always at least one. So that's sum bound. So if, for example, the maximum, that's probably the most natural, naive definition of size. You take the, the biggest conjugate. So now we have some lower bound. The biggest conjugate is at least one. So the question is, well, can the biggest conjugate equal one? Well, this, is, this can be participatory. Can you give me an integer whose absolute value is one? All right, can you give me a second integer whose absolute value is one? All right, let's, let's, go, let's ramp up the level of difficulty. Another algebraic integer whose absolute value is 1. Oh, you're, you're hot. What about another one? OK. I think we're working. Uh, and another one? Could we go a little bit more general? Well, OK. <laughs> okay. So most generally, if you have any root of unity, so any uh, integer who's a, who's a root of this polynomial, and just in general, e to the 2 pi i times k on n, for some integer n, the conjugates, well, the conjugates, if you think about the minimal polynomial, it will divide x to the n minus 1. So in fact, if you take a conjugate of a root of unity, so something whose nth power is 1, its nth power will also be 1. But if you take the absolute values of this equation, you deduce that these numbers have absolute value 1. So there's a whole bunch of algebraic integers, all of, of which have absolute value 1. But on the other hand, they're quite explicit. They're in some sense easy to understand in some very concrete way. Okay, so here is a theorem I'm going to prove. I'm going to give the details. It will be the hardest part of my talk. Give the details of this proof. A theorem of Kronecker from 1857, which is that these are the only algebraic integers whose maximum absolute value is 1. So the we know this is a lower bound, but in fact, these are the only ones. If it has absolute value 1 and it's an algebraic integer, then it has to be one of these roots of unity. So at least to a weak version of our question, the answer of what are the smallest algebraic integers, they will be the roots of unity. Okay. So let's give Kronecker's proof. So what are we allowed to assume? Well, we're allowed to assume that all the, co uh, the conjugates have absolute value at most 1. That's what we're assuming. So let's think about the powers of these numbers. So the degree of an algebraic integer is the degree of the polynomial it satisfies. And it's not so hard to check that if you square a number, or cube it, or take an nth power, its degree doesn't go up. You just imagine I take 1 plus root 5 on 2. If you take any power of that, you'll still have something that satisfies the quadratic equation. What's perhaps less obvious, well, but is also true, is that if you take the conjugates of the powers, you get the powers of the conjugates. 
So certainly, all the conjugates of alpha have absolute value at most one. So certainly, all the powers of the conjugates have absolute value at most one. But the conjugates of the powers are the powers of the conjugates. So they also have absolute value at most one. Okay. So let's suppose alpha is not a root of unity. So what is a way of characterizing numbers that are not roots of unity? Well, this is a very nice characterization. You simply take the powers, alpha, alpha squared, alpha cubed, and if you're not a root of unity, then these numbers are all distinct. So if this is not so hard, if two of them are the same, alpha i equals alpha to the j, you just divide through by alpha to the i, and you get alpha to the power of j minus 1 is equal to 1. And that's the defining property of a root of unity, namely some power of it is equal to 1. Okay. So let's put these facts together. What do we have to show? We have to show that there are only finitely many algebraic integers of some degree d, all of whose conjugates have absolute value at most 1. In other words, let's just say we, suppose, we prove that all algebraic numbers of degree, say, 3, whose conjugates have absolute value at most 1, let's say there's at most 100 of them. Well, if alpha is one of them, then alpha cubed is, and alpha fourth and alpha to the fifth is, but that will be infinitely many unless alpha is the root of unity. So alpha will have some degree d, and then this argument will show that if you have an example that's not a root of unity, you'll produce infinitely many examples by taking its, all its powers of degree at most d. But if there's only finitely many, then that will be a contradiction. Okay. And the proof, the proof is not very hard. We have to look at this polynomial. And basically what we want to say is that if all the alpha have absolute value at most one, then there are only finitely many possible polynomials that we can write down where all these AI integers. And to do that, all we need to show is that each of these integers AI are given a bounded by some constant. If they're bounded by some constant we can give, then of course there's only finitely many integers less than the particular constant. So we're assuming that all these alpha i have absolute value at most 1. What can we say about these a i's? Right. So a1 is just the sum. And so by the triangle inequality that we learned earlier today, this is at most d. If we take a2, this is just the sum of all the pairs. And that's at most by the triangle inequality d choose 2, which is the number of pairs, and so on. Well, probably one more example that I needed to do. H3 is at most d choose 3. And in general, ai is at most d choose i. So if we fix d, then there's only finitely many possible ai that could correspond to one of these polynomials. And so there are only finitely many of these alphas, and therefore they have to be roots of unity. So that's Kronecker's proof, basically. All right. All right, so if you didn't quite follow that, you can just accept it, and we can now move on. So we're not going to use it. We're going to use the fact again, but we're not going to use the proof. All right, so well, we can be a bit more ambitious. We've kind of maybe answered the question. So the smallest, well, we have zero. Then we have roots of unity. But then what's next? So what are the next smallest integers? And so here, what definition are we taking? Well, just for the moment, we're taking the maximum value, because that seemed to work well so far. Well, so let's take this polynomial, x to the n minus 2. This is actually a, well, it certainly is a polynomial with leading coefficient 1. It's actually irreducible. If you've seen Eisenstein's criterion, you could deduce it easily from that. Maybe there are other ways. What of its roots? Explicitly, they're given by the nth root of 2. That's certainly one root. And the other roots are just nth root of 2 times a root of unity. So in fact, if you think about these roots, they all have the same absolute value. And they all have absolute value the nth root of 2. So we, now we can find algebraic integers whose size is the nth root of 2. But of course, we can take n to be bigger and bigger. And what's the limit of this as n goes to infinity? It's 1. So again, we're in trouble. There doesn't seem to be a smallest integer bigger than 1, or bigger than the roots of unity, because we can find things that are somehow have maximum value very close to 1. Okay. So if we take this measure, namely just the maximum, then there really isn't any smallest integer bigger than 1. Well, that's not very satisfactory. So as I said before, we can take different ways of measuring the size. 
So there are two fixes we can take. Well, one fix is, is changing the size, but another fix is we can just restrict the class of algebraic integers. For example, you could just take actual integers. Well, that's pretty easy, because then the next smallest is plus or minus 2, then plus or minus 3, and we wouldn't really learn. But you can be a little bit more, you can find some intermediate class that includes the integers, but maybe a little bit more, but doesn't include, for example, these guys. So that's one fix. So another fix is change the notion of largest. So in general, in mathematics, when you come across some problems, your first guess of what the formulation might be just might not be the right one. It just might not lead to a sensible uh, answer. I mean, it was a sensible question to say what's well, the smallest, but it didn't seem to work, so you just have to try to get something that gives you a little bit something more interesting. Okay. So I'm going to do both of these fixes. And the first one, I'm going to change the notion of largest. So to change the notion of largest, we should think about this example and think about how it fails, uh, like what's causing a problem here. So we have this algebraic integer that's getting really close to 1. But if you observe all its other conjugates, then they're all, all, they're all also bigger than 1. It's not just that we have a single conjugate that's bigger than 1 and the rest are really small. All its conjugates are bigger than 1. So if we can somehow, we're only just taking into account the biggest conjugate. Maybe if we take into account more conjugates, we can somehow penalize this number by the fact that all of its conjugates are bigger than 1. Remember, if we considered the square root of 5 minus 1 on 2, that had one conjugate less than 1 and one conjugate bigger than 1. So that's kind of more genuinely. It has some conjugates that are small. And so this guy is cheating. They're all somehow bigger than 1. So there are a bunch of ways of doing that. So is there a measure which takes this into account? And there's a very natural one called Mahler measure. Well, so what do we have? We have a bunch of conjugates. Some of them have absolute value bigger than 1, well, if, as long as it's not a root of unity, and some have absolute value less than or equal to 1. So you might just say, well, let's just take the product of all of them. But already in the case of root 5 minus 1 on 2, in fact, that times its conjugate is 1, and if you take all its powers and you multiply by its conjugate, you also get 1. So that's not quite right. So instead, let's just take the product of the conjugates that are bigger than 1 and leave out the conjugates that are less than 1. Okay. So for example, well, this is a product over just the conjugates that are bigger than 1. So if it doesn't have any conjugates bigger than 1, well, then we know already by Kronecker it's 0 or a root of unity. But if it's not one of those, then this Mahler measure is strictly bigger than 1. OK, so that's, uh, that's one and a half measures of Mahler, um, which is my cue to remind you this is not named after Gustav, but after Kurt Mahler, who is German slash English slash Australian mathematician, um, uh, for whom who studied this, this idea. OK. So just to remind you, I think I just said this before, one way of interpreting Kronecker's theorem is that the Mahler measure is less than or equal to 1, in, in which case it will just be equal to 1 or maybe not even be defined when 0, if and only if alpha is 0 or it's a root of unity. So what we really like to do is push beyond Kronecker. We want, we want the next smallest integer. So I should have said, what's the third smallest integer? If you didn't my talk. OK, so let's just do a computation. This is the example that, uh, that screwed us up before. So let's just see whether it's causing us problems again. So what are we doing? We're taking the product. Well, now we have all the conjugates, because all the conjugates have absolute value bigger than 1. And so if we take this product, well, what's this product now going to equal? 2. Right? So we just have the nth root of 2 to the power of n. And so that's good. These are somehow not converging to 1. 2 does not converge to 1. So we have some space. <coughs> All right. So now we can ask, well, is what's the algebraic integer with smallest Mahler measure bigger than 1? So another thing, actually, when you think about uh, finding smallest or finding exceptional examples, you don't usually expect your exceptional example to be completely weird. You expect it to be maybe something you know, something you're familiar with. So we might start with some numbers 
that, if, that, we, are, that we are familiar with. So you might ask, well, can we actually do better than this? So let's take the number we started with, root 5 minus 1 on 2. It has two conjugates. One of them is root 5 minus 1 on 2, which is less than 1. So we put a 1 in there for the model measure. The other is you swap the sign. And if you get this number here, well, this is probably, uh, well, this is what it is. So we, we've beaten 2. So this is actually a famous number. I think you probably all know what it is. It's the golden ratio. Great. That would be great if that was the answer, and a nice, well-known number. Well, except it's not the best answer. So I'm not sure if you can actually guess anything that's smaller than this so far. Does anyone, has anyone? So well, I was, was going to say root 2, but all right. Uh, in fact, we can do better than root 2. We, can, we have this number, x cubed minus x minus 1. It's not quite so nice. So if you look at the roots, what it has, if you evaluate this polynomial at 1, you get minus 1. So it certainly has a real root bigger than 1. Uh, and then the other two roots, you can check, are complex numbers, and they have, have absolute value less than 1. And so if you take the Mahler measure of this, well, there are three roots, but only one of them has absolute value bigger than 1, and it's real. So you get this, and so you have the following number, 1.32417. So yes, this is less nice of a number, but as someone pointed out from the audience, this does also have a name. It's called the plastic number. So it's a somewhat ridiculous name. You'd think, actually, this has some relation to maybe aspects of plastic that you arrange in some way, but I think it's more a, a kind of early, 19, uh, early 20th century French philosopher slash architect who believed that various cubes with proportions according to a certain way, it looked somehow more beautiful. But, well, so you don't, since you don't know the name of that architect, it's probably safe to say it doesn't, uh, it's not so good. Anyway, all right, so, well, this is at least, at least has a name, here's a number. So can you do better than that? Well, all right, we're now getting ugly. Here's a polynomial, it's degree 10, it's irreducible. It has one real root greater than one. Well, let's, we can check that it has at least one real root greater than one. If we evaluate this at one, hopefully it's going to be negative. One, two, one, zero, minus one, minus two, minus three. It's minus one, good. So it has at least one real root greater than one. It has eight complex roots. They actually have absolute value literally equal to one. And then, well, it's not so hard to check from this. It has one real root less than one. And so the Mahler measure of this polynomial is just the real root that's bigger than 1. And what is this number? This is 1.1762. This is actually looking pretty bad. We're going down. We, we started at 2, 1 1.6, 1 1.3, 1 1.17. This is looking like we're converging to 1. Okay. But amazingly enough, there's a conjecture of Adlema made in 1933, which is that if alpha is neither 0 <coughs> nor a root of unity, then its Mahler measure is at least this number. Oh, this is a ridiculous conjecture in some sense. I mean, this is this, not, this degree 10 polynomial. It's coming out of nowhere. I mean, it doesn't have a nice Galois group. It's just somehow, I mean, it has some fairly small coefficients. That's kind of, I mean, that's sort of maybe not so expected. But, but somehow this is a very surprising conjecture, I think. Um, and, of course, it's always a little bit unfair in mathematics. Often conjectures are named after the wrong people. Lehmann actually did think about this, but he didn't actually conjecture this at all. He just found this polynomial with this property. So he gets the credit if it's right, but I, he doesn't get the blame if it's wrong. All right. So you can ask, actually, a softer version of this conjecture. Whenever you have a precise, it's, always, it's great to have a precise conjecture. A precise conjecture is something, you know, if I give you this conjecture, you can come back to me tomorrow and go, here's a degree 70 polynomial for which the value is 1.16. Your conjecture is wrong. But... It's still useful also to think about weaker versions. Namely, you could say the weak version is that, well, maybe this isn't the smallest, but maybe you, you can't get its bound. Maybe it's bounded away from one. Maybe at least there is some smallest, or maybe at least you somehow can't get an infinite sequence of one. So that's nice. That's also a good conjecture. But the first one is somehow falsifiable. The second one, I mean, unless you produce infinitely many, you can't just come back and be, well, here's one, something with 1.001 because that doesn't prove anything. 
So it's nice to have something falsifiable, but it's also nice to think just about the general problem in a slightly weaker formulation. Okay. All right, so this is 1933, so the question is, what do we know about this so far? Well, here's the following result. This is essentially the best result now. So before I try to read out what this theorem actually means, let's just imagine we're in a fixed degree D. Right? And let's imagine in fixed degree D, and let's just I imagine I tell you that the roots of all the polynomials, let's just say that their absolute value is at most 2. So if you think about the proof of Kronecker's theorem, if I tell you the degree is 7 and all the roots are at most 2, you can still bound the coefficients. And so if I give you a bound on the roots and I give you a, ba a, ba a bound on the degree, you can just write down all the polynomials. So you know a priori that if you're in a fixed degree, if you're in a fixed degree, you can't get arbitrarily close to 1. Now you could try and work through the argument and you'd get some bound that would be somehow horribly super exponential. But there is always, at least in a fixed degree, a particular bound. So the content here is not that there is some inequality, but that's a, well, a decent one. On the other hand, as d gets bigger and bigger, well, I mean, there's a theorem of analytic number theory that log of log d is constant, and 1 on log d is going to get bigger and bigger. So this is getting closer and closer to 1. So this doesn't prove Lemmas conjecture. In fact, it's a long way from it in some sense. So why am I putting it here? Well, it's the best result towards Lemmas conjecture, which is really completely open. So the problem's too hard. Okay, that also happens in mathematics, I'm sad to say. So what do you do in mathematics when the problem is too hard? You change the problem. You try to make it some, somewhat easy. So again, there's two things you can do. Uh, you can restrict to the class of, of special algebraic integers. So even in this particular version of the problem, in terms of Mahler measure, there's lots of different cases in which it is known. For example, I think if you know all the coefficients of the minimal polynomial are odd, then it's true. If you know, for example, uh, that alpha is a root, but 1 on alpha is not a root, then you know it's true. There are many cases in which it's known, but somehow there is a very specific class of cases which are just still intractable. Here's another case in which this particular problem comes up. If you take uh, just a graph in the plane, then it has uh, an adjacency matrix. If you take the roots of the adjacency matrix, because it's symmetric, they'll all be real, and there'll be a particular largest conjugate. So you also get some class of integers, algebraic integers coming up. The, this problem is known for that. So you have some specific minimum graph in which this Mahler measure turns up. And in fact, you actually have in that description, a fairly natural way, and probably possibly the most natural way in which the Mahler measure comes up. If I'll just say this, which you don't necessarily have to know, it's not written down, there are various Dinkin diagrams, uh, and certain classes of Dinkin diagrams, which correspond to Lie groups, and if you take their corresponding eigenvalues, you get roots of unity. But if you start adding edges, well, either you still have Dinkin diagrams, or you get away from Dinkin diagram, and the eigenvalues become bigger than one. You can write down a very nice graph, which is just E8 plus a little bit, for which you get the Mahler measure as an eigenvalue. So it's not a complete, maybe I sort of, I gave it a bad rep as saying it's completely random. It comes up in, in other contexts in which you can really answer the question. Mahler measure also comes up when you're thinking about not complements, when you're thinking about uh, a bunch of different things. So it, it, it has come up both in the formulation of this problem and in other contexts before. But the conjecture is too hard, so we're going to make it easier. So we're going to consider a special class of algebraic integers. Okay. So, well, what class? So we'll consider cyclotomic integers. So what's a cyclotomic integer? It's those that can be written as, well, not just roots of unity, but sums of roots of unity. Okay. So roots of unity are integers, sums of integers are integers. So let me just give another characterization for those of you who've done Galois theory. These are exactly the algebraic integers in abelian extensions of Q. So it's a theorem of Kronecker and Weber that the only abelian extensions of Q are given by adjoining roots of unity. And the, ring, uh, the, and the algebraic integers inside uh, the fields of roots of unities, uh, fields of 
roots of unity are just exactly sums of roots of unity. Okay. So that's a kind of a nice class. But if you don't know what abelian is, it doesn't matter. So let's give some examples. So the roots of unity themselves, we've already thought about those. They're certainly cyclotopic integers. What are some other things? Well, you can take a root of unity and you can add it to its inverse. So if you just use, say, De Marva's formula, this is one way of writing two cos of 2 pi on n. So that's also interesting. It's not even obvious when you think about 2 cosine of 2 pi on n whether it's even algebraic. So here it is, it's algebraic. And as long as you multiply by 2, it's even an integer. If you don't multiply by 2, it's typically not an algebraic integer. Well, we can do some specific examples. I can let n be 5. Then you can compute cosine of, well, I guess, 360 on 5 is oh, 72, I hope. Well, you can compute cosine, and you get this value. So we've seen this before as well. Okay, so our, the, our, our friend, the golden ratio, is a, is a algebraic integer. Here's a bit more uh, complicated example. This is some sum here on the left-hand side. It's a Gauss sum. But you get here the square root of p. So what this means, well, of course, there's an i in there if p is a, a, satisfies a, is 3 mod 4. But you can get, i is also a root of unity, you can get the square root of p, and therefore you can get the square root of n for any integer n. So the square root of n for any integer n is an algebraic integer. Uh, sorry, is a cyclotomic integer. So that's a class of things that we have. But we don't have the cube root of 2. That is not a cyclotomic integer. Uh, and to prove it, well, you would need to use the characterization of the fact that I gave in the last page that it corresponds to an abelian extension. If you take the Galois closure of, of the field given by the cube root of 2, you get something with Galois group S3, which is not abelian. So therefore, this is not a cyclotomic integer. Okay. So these are the integers we're going to consider now. All right, so here's our new problem. We couldn't solve the old problem, so we can ask, what's the smallest cyclotomic integer bigger than 1? All right, we have, what? we have 0. We have all the roots of unity themselves. And the question is, what's next? So again, we have a question about what we're going to say about biggest. We can either do Mahler measure. That works in general. but we could also return to our previous definition. If we thought about our previous definition, the thing that was causing us problems, well, maybe there were other problems, but the nth root of 2. But we don't have to worry about the nth root of 2 anymore. So maybe we can return to our naive definition, which is maybe really the happiest definition, which is just you take the largest conjugate. So here's some notation. It's called the house of alpha. Alpha is living inside its house. And it's just defined to be the largest of its conjugates. Okay. So, as I said before, the nth root of 2, well, not just for n is equal to 3, but for any n bigger than 2 is not cyclotomic. So, already in this problem, we don't even know that this exists. But hopefully, we've restricted the class to some uh, set of integers for which we can make sense of the problem. Okay. So, the theorem the smallest cyclotomic integer whose house is bigger than 1 is the following. Well, so it's going to be root 2. So we've also seen that before. And let me continue on. So let me explain what all the possible values of the house are that are less than 2. It could be 0, if it's 0. It could be 1, if it's a root of unity. It could be root 2. So that's certainly an algebraic integer. The golden ratio is also an algebraic integer. That's the next smallest. <coughs> root 3 is the next smallest. Well, maybe you're starting to see a pattern here. 2 cos of pi, cosine of pi on 7 is the next. And in general, the only possible sizes of algebraic integers less than 2 are given by these values. So 0, 1, and 2 cosine pi of n for any possible n. This is always less than 2. And in fact, these guys are converging to 2. Okay. This, in fact, is not even that hard to prove. You could actually prove it 
You can prove it using Kronecker's theorem uh, using a few tricks. So let's just think about this set. This is an interesting set. So we really have a discrete set of possibilities at the beginning, 0, 1, and then root 2, golden ratio, root 3, and then we have a, a limit point of our set that's converging to 2. And so then, well, what happens past 2? So, I mean, maybe all hell breaks loose and you somehow get some dense sequence of things. It's not so obvious what happens. So you could ask, well, what happens next? So in fact, even though we have a, a limit, a limit of all these possibilities, it turns out that once you reach 2, there's another gap. So you can write down, in fact, another sequence. So you can write the smallest atomic integer greater than 2. So there's another gap. So this is the next value here. So i plus the 2 cosine of pi on 7. If you take this, this is equal to this, well, by Pythagoras, the square root of 1 plus 4 cos 2 pi of 7 is 2.0608. So that means if you have an algebraic integer that's less than this, whose, whose house is less than this, then, in fact, its house has to be less than or equal to 2. So this is really quite in contrast to, if you just think about the algebraic integers, even just the rational numbers sitting, well, if you think about the algebraic integers sitting somehow on the complex plane, they're actually dense. But of course, we're not taking just the algebraic integers, we're taking their largest conjugates. And here, the largest conjugates, at least in the cyclotomic case, are exhibiting this somehow strange behavior in which the possible sizes are kind of living in this sort of, this kind of spectral uh, kind of region, which they have limits points. And here we have this other gap. Well, we can write out some more. There's i of cos 2 cos pi and 8. There's i of 2 cos pi and n. Here's a whole new sequence of things. And here we have some other limit point. And here the limit point is now root 5. Okay, well, I'm not saying that these are the only ones from 2 to root 5. But at least here's a, here's a kind of sequence of things. And so you could ask, well, what, what's going on? Well, let's think about the numbers we had so far. Well, 0, 0 is the sum of 0 roots of unity. Okay, roots of unity are the sum of 1 roots of unity. 2 cosine 2 pi on n. They're the sum of two roots of unity. These numbers here are the sum of three roots of unity. So if you imagine actually you have a sum of n roots of unity, well, there's lots of different ways of writing down sum of n roots of unity. But whatever number you write down, its conjugates will all have absolute value at most, well, in fact, n. So there's lots of sequences of things you can write down. So these guys are all sums of three roots of unity, which have all these various limit points. All right, so the question is, well, what else is there? So you could ask, is this list complete? So in other words, have we determined the size of every, uh, of the house of every cyclotomic integer less than root 5? So Castles told us the answer if we were less than root 4, which is 2. But what about in this region? Well, there's a conjecture. Well, now this is 1966. It's a bit more recent than 1933. Uh, of Raphael Robinson, that the only other values of this house that are less than this, besides the one we saw on the other page, are the following two exotic examples. This number here, so 1 plus z to 13, that's, that's a 13th root of e, it's e to the 2 pi on 13. That number on the left is not a real number, so you really take its absolute value and you get this. And there's this number here, well that is actually real, and it's equal to itself. And it's, it's its biggest conjugate, and it's equal to this value, 2.188. These are both less than root 5. So in other words, Robinson conjectured that there were this very nice sequence of, of sums of three roots of unity, and these guys here. Well, that first number is also a sum of three roots of unity. That number down here, it's not so obvious how to write it as a sum of roots of unity. In fact, you can write it as a sum of four uh, 84th roots of unity. But even just, even trying to do that is 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 somewhat tricky. And in fact, it's hard, if you write, if you have a number as, as, as three roots of unity, maybe you can also write it as a sum of four roots of unity. And actually being able to work out if you can decide one is equal to another is a pretty tricky problem. Right? Because sometimes you might have some roots of unity that cancel each other out. If I take 
one, that's the sum of one root of unity. But if I take a third root of unity omega, omega plus omega squared, well, I add them together, I get minus one. So that's a number that's the sum of one root of unity and two roots of unity. Okay. I guess I also wanted to say Raphael Robinson, he was a professor at Berkeley, but he's perhaps, well, uh, more famous, probably more well known as the husband of, of uh, Julia Robinson, who was one of the two people who solved Hilbert's 10th problem. Uh, Julia, she was also the president of the AMS and a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And also being Berkeley at the 60s, he was the professor and they didn't give her a job. Uh, but just because that was what the 60s were like. But then in the 70s, she did become a professor, full professor at Berkeley. Uh, yeah. Okay. So now a theorem. Well, this is Frederick Robinson, no relation. <laughs> and Michael Wurtz is that this conjecture is correct. Okay. Robinson, yes, you fruit. I, I didn't deliberately set Robinson to work on Robinson's conjecture, but there was some. Okay. So what's the strategy? All right. So we have to somehow exploit the fact that we have cyclotomic integers in some nice way. And it turns out that the right way to do it is to think about a different way of, of taking an average. So well, this isn't literally an average. I mean, this is, a bit, this is a bit like an L2 norm. You're taking the average of the squares. Maybe you want to take its square root if you wanted to turn it into a real average, but of course you don't need to do that. So we have this quantity here that's the sum of the conjugate squared. All right. So why is this quantity actually nicer in the cyclotomic case than in the general case? Well, we can just compute this in our heads for, say, the cube root of 2. The cube root of 2 has three conjugates. They all have the same absolute value, which is the cube root of 2. The square is the cube root of 4. The average of all their conjugates cubed is just the cube root of 4. So if I put in the cube root of 2 here, I would get the cube root of 4. But for cyclotomic integers, you always get a rational number. And that's not true for, so it's certainly not true for cube root of 2. It's not true for just the house of a, of a cyclotomic integer as a cyclotomic. So let me do an example, 1 plus root 5 on 2. That's degree 2. So it should be a half. Well, its square is this, and its absolute value. And its conjugate squared is 3 minus root 5 on 2. Okay. So why, what works better with cyclotomic integers? Well, there's some kind of interplay going on here. On the one hand, we're taking the conjugates and taking the absolute value squared. But you could also try taking the absolute value squared and taking the conjugate. And it's not so clear that doing those things in different orders gives you the same thing. And in general, they don't. But for cyclotomic things, they do. And it's somehow, it's, I mean, explicitly, I can tell you, it's because complex conjugation is commuting with all the other Gower automorphisms. And because it's abelian, things commute. But that's not important. You can somehow write it down. And so you have these nice numbers. Okay. So, well, it satisfies some fairly basic inequalities. I've just put the definition up the top so we have to remember it. Certainly, um, it's bounded by uh, the square of the house. I mean, it's an average, somehow, of the squares of the conjugates. So it's less than or equal to the biggest of those conjugates which is the house squared. So, of course, it's, so it's, it's a good kind of average. So, what's the situation? Well, in Castle's argument, he basically showed how, in principle, if this measure m alpha is small, then you can compute all the possible cyclotomic m alpha. So that sounds like we win. We have just m alpha is less than or equal to 5. Let's just compute all the cyclotomic integers less than or equal to 5, and we win. But in practice, the method only works when m alpha can be real, is slightly bigger than 3. It has some very super exponential growth in a number of cases you need to check. Okay. So, well, what do we have? Well, suppose alpha is actually equal to root 5. Well, then it, it's, that its square of, of its absolute value is 5. The square of the absolute value of its conjugate is also 5. The average of 5 and 5 is 5. So we'd have equality in that case. Okay. 
But let's now suppose that it's less than root 5. So we have some kind of average. If you have an average of numbers which are less than root 5, I mean, how can it be possible that an average of numbers less than root 5 gives you something close to root 5? The only way is if all those numbers are pretty close to root 5. Right? If, if, you have, if all the numbers are bounded by a certain fixed thing, the only way that can also be close to the average is if all the numbers are actually pretty close to root 5. But that's going to play up against the fact that these numbers are algebraic. We're going to have some algebraic numbers, all of which are somehow very close to root 5. But we're going to see that algebraic numbers repel each other in some sense. That will explain so here's a lemma that goes at least part of the way. So let's suppose that the biggest conjugate is less than root 5. And then either, well, it could equal root 5. But let's say it's strictly less than root 5. Then we're going to prove this average is less than or equal to 4. So just for free, we're going to show that it can't be really close to root 5. So it has to be less than or equal to it. That this average can't be close to 5. It has to be at most 4. All right. So the proof of the lemma. So we have that the biggest conjugate has absolute value 5, and we want that the average of the conjugates of the square, of, of the absolute value squared, is the most form. Okay. So, well, we're going to do some calculus. 4 minus x minus log of x minus 5 is bigger or equal to 0. So I think you could probably prove that. Uh, but I'm going to give you a graph just so you believe, because graphs prove everything. So here's a graph. Actually, somehow looking at this graph, it looks like it goes below 4. <laughs> but we can check the value at 4. is 4 minus 4 minus log of 1, which is 0. So it, OK. Play, play, math, play Mathematica. That's another rule of mathematics, is never trust Mathematica. OK. So proof by diagram. There we go. All right. So what do we have? We have these alpha i squared, and we're taking an average. Well, let's just give another name to these, these guys, the beta i's. So the point, as I kind of implied before, is because we're in a cyclotomic extension, these guys are all conjugates of each other. So we have a bunch of conjugates, and we know that they're all less than 5, and we want to see, can their average be really close to 5? So what are we going to do? I'm going to take the sum of this inequality here. 4 minus beta i. So this, each term is big or equal to 0. So certainly the sum is big or equal to 0. All right, great. So let's now extract some of these terms from the sum. Well, the 4 becomes 4d. The sum of the beta i, well, this mi is the average. So the sum of, of, of these guys is just d times the average. So the left-hand side is d times the average. And we just move the remainder term, the log, over to the right-hand side. Well, log of a sum. Sorry, sum of a log is log of a product. So we get this guy here. So, so far, we haven't used any fact about these bi being algebraic. These could just be real numbers less than or equal to 5. And so what do we want to show? We want to show the left-hand side is at least 0. So we want to show when is log of something at least 0. It's when this thing inside is at least 1. Right, so in other words, we, we don't want these bi to be really close to, to 5, which will make this really small. But what do we have here? We have a product. I mean, these bi's are all conjugates. And when you subtract 5, well, the conjugates of b minus 5 are just also these other conjugates of bi minus 5. So this is just a collection of conjugates of the same number. And we saw right at the beginning, when you take the product of the conjugates of an algebraic integer, you always get an integer. And in particular, as long as we're assuming that, that we don't actually equal 5, it has to be at least log 1. So we win. So that's great. Now we've got the bound down to 4, but we have to go further than that. So you might ask, well, here I use the fact that the, the algebraic integers weren't that close to 5. But I can also use the fact that they're not close to 4, or they're not close to 3. So how can I exploit that? Well, I want to kind of generalize this inequality by maybe putting more terms here on the right and decreasing this 4. So let's try and find a constant c as small as possible such that we can subtract off some multiples of x minus 5, and x minus 4, and x minus 3. So previously, we just had log of x minus 5. 
But we have these other things too, and the, the exact same arguments will show you for any A1, A2, and A3 that if this inequality is satisfied, at least in the interval from 0 to 5, then we'll get our average down below C. So unfortunately, at this point, we're getting to the number of variables that we can't actually literally solve this. And you, if you remember from calculus, you always had these nice examples. You computed the derivative. It's 0 was at 2. You plugged it in. It all worked out beautifully. Here we have these four variables. Well, if you take the derivative, it actually looks pretty good. You get some polynomial rational function of degree 3 with four variable coefficients. So you can solve the cubic and then plug it back into the log and then try and see what the value is. But that doesn't look very good. But you can at least do this numerically. You can play around. Well, you can just look at the graph, and you can just try changing these coefficients in some way. So well, you can plug in these values, which you don't find, you find by playing it. And what do you see? <laughs> you see that you can get down, at least numerically, you can get down to c equals 7 on 2. So that, that's getting a lot further. So let me draw the graph. Here's the graph. So let me just point out some salient features of this graph. So here, we're, we're using the fact that it can't all be close to 3, 4, or 5. So we have these factors of log of x minus 3, log of x minus 4, and log of x minus 5. They're giving us these vertical asymptotes. And here, we're just playing a purely numerical game. What we're allowed to do is we're allowed to kind of add more to the asymptote at either of these points. So we might say, let's see if I, oh, let's try and point here. Oof. We might say, well, how do we improve the situation here? Well, maybe I could bump up the log of x minus 3 factor. If I bump this up, I can lift this graph up here, but then I'm going to lose things over this region here. But maybe I can kind of put, plug, pull up the log 4 factor and the log x minus 5 factor so that this goes up and then this goes down and then try and balance it. You have a game in which you kind of have two, it's a tug of war between one sink and the other sink, and you're trying to plug in values to kind of get the balance right. And you don't just get here immediately, you get to here after some sort of chain of things where you're trying to find the right values. But you start to get stuck around here, and you go, what's going on? What are these, what are these two recalcitrant points that you're left with? Well, on this graph, you can't quite see it to this many decimal places, but you have the following two numbers. Well, if you take them, they, they, don't, they look not particularly auspicious, but they have a nice sum. So what, what are the, see if you can recognize the sum. So, yes, it's not supposed to be a hard question. The, the number, if you add them up, you get something pretty close to 7. Something that maybe require a bit more mental dexterity. If you can try and compute their product, I'll tell you the answer is an integer, and you can tell me what it is. You have to estimate it to within a half. It's 11. Okay. You can give yourself a tick if you thought of that one. All right. So, these two recalcitrant points, you actually know what they are, the 7 minus root 5 on 2 and 7 plus root 5 on 2. Well, once you see this, of course, there's no wonder you couldn't go any further. These are two algebraic integers whose average is 7 on 2. So there's no way you could have beaten that game. But then you think, well, of course, I know my algebraic integer can't be close to 3, 4, or 5. It can't be close to this algebraic integer either. So let's try putting that in as well. So what do we do? Well, let's just have a combination of a whole bunch of polynomials. There's the PI. These AI, the coefficients here we've had before, I might talk about at the end later. So there's that polynomial. Let's just put in log of that. And by the same argument, when you take the log of this product, you'll get something, all of his conjugates, will, will, the product will be a minus 1. But there are other things as well. You can start playing around. You just play around, and whenever you get stuck, you go, well, is there an algebraic integer near there? Let's just try throwing that in. You keep going. You keep going. So here, let me just, for example, look at this last example. This last example, the root of this is actually an algebraic cyclotomic integer for which the value of m is actually, well, the sum 13 divided by 4. So you get, you get that value here. So here, these n on the right-hand side, these actually correspond, these absolute values correspond to the absolute value of i plus 2 cos of, of pi on n. Well, this number 8 doesn't, but on the other hand, you can compute the Galois group, and it's not abelian, so it's not even cyclotomic. Okay. So you, the same game and the same proof, you let f be this sum here, and it's bigger or equal to 0. And so you deduce that this m is bounded now by just 
well, four by three and a, and a quarter, and now that's close enough to win the Castle's game. So this is a graph of that function, drawn on a logarithmic scale, so you can see all its points. And somehow this was found really just by a kind of more advanced version of this playing with three, four, and five. You try to be a little bit more clever about which ones you want to try to put in, and then you use various things. Of course, you have some very high dimensional space, and you're trying to find minimum. Minima. Maybe there's something much better, and you could sort of extend this result further. But it's a bit hard to kind of check when you have that. Okay. So this is good enough to uh, effectively carry out Castle's procedure and, and prove Robinson's conjecture. Okay. So that just to summarize. So the smallest non-zero algebraic integers, really by any possible measure that makes sense of the roots of unity. Beyond this, well, depending on how you measure it, well, either one, it didn't make sense, either two, nobody knows, but there's a guess, or if you restrict the cyclotomic integers, then you get root two and some very nice sort of spectrum that you can kind of compute completely, at least up to root five. Well, you can keep going. So in fact, Robinson and Woods, they go a little bit further. That's the next one. And then you can start to ask, what is the structure of this set of absolute values? And so here's a question that seems to be true. So already sort of, sort of bringing up, we have, of course, another problem about mathematics that's good, is whenever you solve a question, it tends to suggest another question that's harder. It's like the finish line is always moving away from you. And so when you observe th this list, of course, you don't get a discrete set. We have these limit points at 2 at root 5. But what seems to happen is that the set of values you get seems to be closed. So just to kind of explain why that's somehow very strange, certainly the set of algebraic inti of integers is not closed. If you take the closure of that, you get every single co complex number. But the set of values of the house, the cyclotomic integers, seems to be a closed set. Okay, that's the end of my talk. <laughs>